not everything supernatural is a miracle. Every miracle is supernatural. Example, regeneration is not a miracle, but it's a supernatural work of God. A miracle is a visible manifestation of the invisible God. A miracle is something that is external because it has verification power. Sign, power, and wonder are the three words for miracle, and sign is the one that says it signifies something. So the regeneration is not a sign. The regeneration is an invisible, internal act. It's miraculous, supernatural, but it's not a miracle. A miracle is a technical thing that's a subcategory of the supernatural, namely events that occur in the external world and have confirmatory value while they uh, occur. The second thing to notice here is that miracles depend upon his unchangeable will. They are not things that you can name it, claim it. They're not things, there's not a power there to tap into like the force in Star Wars. That's a pantheistic concept of supernormal. And I've come only in recent years to the conclusion that we do a disservice to the biblical concept of miracle when we refer to these other events as supernatural. Almost all the great classical theologians, and again, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, and the great theologians, said only God can do miracles. Satan cannot do miracles. Uh, Warfield held the same view, and yet today it's very common for people, Walter Martin's an example, when he, uh, the manuscript for my book on signs and wonders, which Satan can perform miracles. And yet throughout the, the book you're denying that Satan can do miracles. Well, that's a very important point. Yeah, you just look at all the classical theologians, and there's a very important reason why Satan cannot perform miracles. Because a miracle by definition is an act of God. And Satan cannot perform acts of God. All you have to do is think about for a moment. God is infinite, Satan is finite. Only God can create, Satan can't. So we know right there that Satan and God are in two totally different categories. And I think a lot of the anti-cult ministries today are really giving indirect credence to Satan by giving him too much power. He does not have the power to perform supernatural acts. And what is he doing? Most of what Satan does can be categorized uh, in two subcategories. One, the master magician. Two, the super scientist. Let's take them one by one. Satan is a trickster. He's a deceiver. When the words, signs, wonder, and power are used of Satan in 2 Thessalonians 2, in the Antichrist uh, doing it with power, it says that they are false signs and wonders. It's qualified. Uh, the, when these kind of things occurred in the Bible, it says they did them by magical powers, the magicians of Egypt. Miracles and magic are two different categories. Magic is trickery. Either the hand is quicker than the eye, fooling the mind, fooling the eyes, or different ways to fool people with magic, but it's trickery. You're, you're being fooled. Satan is the great fooler. He is the world's best deceiver. So he simulates miracles by purely natural powers. But remember, natural for Satan is a much higher level of natural than natural for humans because Satan has super intelligence. He's much smarter than we are. So he's a much better magician. So he can fool the world's best magician by his tricks. They're just much better tricks. I'm going all the way, and I'll, I'll explain that in terms of that very illustration. Let's take Moses and the magicians of Egypt. What were they able to simulate? Snake. The rod becoming the, the snake. Water turned to blood. 
frogs, and then where did they stop and say, this is the finger of God? When he made lice out of dust, he says, the finger of God. So verify, certainly we know at least that they cannot create life, Satan cannot create life. Now, I argue that the other, one, the other ones they did were only tricks too on two grounds, one exegetical and then just the, the other theological. On the exegetical grounds, it says this they did by their magical arts. They were doing them by magical powers. These were tricks. I have a friend who lived there for 20 years, and he said he's seen them do some of those same things. He's seen them, for example, they will, uh, they have the power to, uh, to hypnotize or to enchant snakes, so they look like a rod, and then they throw them down and and they wiggle away. They're really snakes to begin with that they make look like rods. They're not rods that really wiggle on the ground later. He said there's also a, an element that if you throw in the water, it will look like uh, blood. He said he's seen them do that very uh, thing. So he, he believes that these things can be done. And when you think of what modern magicians are doing, even Christian magicians, Danny Corum and Andre Cole, for example, when you think of what they are doing, uh, or even some of the non-Christian magicians making the Statue of Liberty vanish, making a, a Learjet vanish off the runway. And we know that's just a trick. We know they're, they're not really vanishing. Uh, the magicians of Egypt didn't do anything as great as what um, the modern magicians are doing. You need to read Andre Cole's book, Miracle and Magic. It's a great book because in it he shows how a lot of this stuff, including so-called resurrections from the dead, he verified, he went to, uh, in some African country, some chief had claimed to, uh, or some witch doctor had claimed to resurrect somebody from the dead, and he went and researched it, and they had dug a tunnel, and the guy hit himself, and Beetlejuice came out, and they had a blank uh, gun, and, you know, he came back in. I mean, it's, it's very, very fascinating reading. So I'm contending on, on really three grounds. One, exegetical grounds. Two, an overall theological grounds that only God can do miracles. And three, an empirical magical ground. The magicians, including Houdini, said that he can reduplicate anything these people can do, and magicians are reduplicating it. Yeah, I, I said there are three grounds for it. And the, the theological ground is that a miracle, by definition in the Bible, is an act of God. And only God can perform acts of God. That would be the theological ground. It's a problem text. Uh, my own impression of the text is that God intervened uh, in the witch's tent and performed a miracle because she was surprised too. She was rebuked by it and she was surprised by it. That she did not bring Samuel up, but that God brought uh, Samuel back and rebuked both Saul and the witch for what they were doing. I'm going to another deal with the fact that uh, there are no black magic and white magic. And so it is an under the court to see performing an act that is glorifying the faith. No, see, the word magic is used in a different sense in, in, in America. The word magic in America is used for illusionism. They are, uh, they're technically illusionists. Uh, but we use the word magic to cover uh, what uh, illusionists do, and the word magic in most other places, including historically and in many other countries, is a word connected only with the occult. But these, quote, Christian magicians are really Christian illusionists. They're entertainers, and they're just uh, entertaining a crowd by their ability to do certain things. It has nothing to do with the occult or the supernatural.
Okay, and the same in Revelation 16, you could add that, that the, the spirits of demons performing miracles at the end of the tribulation period. And now we have all of the passages. I mean, the Revelation 13, Revelation 16, uh, Matthew 24, you might throw in Matthew 7. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we done many wonderful things in your name? He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, that exhausts all of the passages that clearly use the words or imply signs and wonders of things that Satan or his cohorts can do. So there's no question that the words are used. The question is whether Satan has the same supernatural powers and whether both the context and the adjectives used in those contexts qualify the kinds of signs and wonders they do. Now in the one passage, we definitely have adjectives calling them lying signs and wonders. Now, if they're called lying signs and wonders explicitly in one passage because they're performed by Satan or his cohorts, then they are lying signs and wonders whether they're called that or not in the other passages because they're not just sometimes lying signs and wonders and other times not. And in the other passages, the context clearly indicates, my goodness, you're talking about the Antichrist and setting up an image and asking to be worshipped. There's no question he's a deceiver. As to whether the person was really resurrected, the text does not say that, that he was really resurrected there. And I think on other grounds in the Bible, it's pretty clear that only God can resurrect the dead. So I think we'd be on very shaky theological grounds, and, and we would lose the total apologetic value of the unique Christian miracle, which is resurrection. Because suppose Satan can do it. Suppose Satan can really resurrect the dead then how do we know that the unique resurrections of Christ, of Lazarus, or of himself, are really divine acts? We, we don't really know. I know, but so do Satan's followers say the same thing. See, it loses its total apologetic value. Once you place Satan's powers, and, you know, you almost have to step back from an issue like this and look at it theologically. Aren't we kind of exalting Satan by, and making almost a dualistic universe, yeah, uh, where you have almost co-equal powers being... I think that Satan really rejoices in that kind of thing. I think that Satan really says he's getting a lot of press out of it, and he's getting a lot more power than he has, when I think what we need to do is pin on him exactly what the Bible says. He's a liar, he's a deceiver, and he's defeated and his powers are absolutely nothing compared to God. He can fake and simulate and do a lot of things to deceive a lot of people, but he doesn't have, he's just a creature and his powers are limited as anything else uh, in this universe It's a finite creature. I think that's the proper perspective to put it in. And whatever we say, regardless of the semantical debate here as to whether the term miracle or supernatural ought to be used of Satan, I think what we have to do is to say God is in a unique category because number one, only he is infinite, Satan is finite. Number two, only God can create life, Satan can't. Number three, only God can restore life, which is the same as creating it, really, Satan can't. So whatever else we want to say of how powerful Satan's powers are and whether we should use the word miracle or supernatural, let's always preserve this infinite gulf between God and Satan and not give Satan too much press. What do you say then, Satan? I understand the category of No. No, I was getting to I didn't quite get to it. I knew that it would evoke a interesting discussion because this is a hotly debated topic. But my two points are that once I acknowledge that only God can perform miracles, I, it's incumbent upon me to explain the supernormal things Satan is doing. And I use the word supernormal deliberately. I reserve supernatural for God, so at least 
uh, groove into the terminology I'm using here. Only God can do supernatural things. Only God can do true miracles. But Satan can do supernormal things. He can do paranormal things and supernormal things. How does he do them? Primarily in two ways. Super scientist and master magician. And the master magician, I was just developing that a little bit. The master magician, you talk to Danny Coram. I think the people in the best position to, to talk on this topic are the Christian illusionists because they know how powerful the ability to deceive is. That's their business, deceiving for entertaining purpose. And, and they know, and they have exposed both Danny Coram and uh, also uh, Andre Cole, as well as the Amazing Randy, and this is where skeptics, thank God for skeptics, you know, like Amazing Randy who follows these people around, debunks everything that they do. They know that the power to deceive is so great that many people believe it's really a supernatural power that those people had, when once you explain it, there's nothing supernatural about it at all. And the book is just filled with good illustrations. I won't go into them uh, now. Secondly, super scientists, bringing down fire from heaven, Revelation 13. Scientists can do that right now. Scientists can do that right now. Now, think of what, what a atomic weapon is to a Hottentot. Uh, a, Satan's advanced knowledge of um, super laser, or whatever uh, the next thing would be, is so great that he could even fool the greatest scientist in the world. What a scientist right now cannot conceive of doing with the present scientific knowledge, Satan already knows how to do. And by purely natural powers, tapping these natural powers, can do these types of things. So I don't at all find it difficult to explain anything the Bible says Satan uh, does, including the other big toughie is uh, the book of Job, where apparently Satan had something to do with a whirlwind because you remember God gave, gave him leave and said, okay, go ahead, and a whirlwind came, and uh, what, which one did the whirlwind take? Was that his sons or his stock or his, uh, his children? The whirlwind flattened the house and killed his children. So including that, I mean, scientists can create whirlwinds, and a super scientist could create a super whirlwind. So I don't have any problem explaining anything Satan does uh, because those two categories, master, deceiver, and super scientist, would, uh, would do it. That gives him, now there's possibly a third ca category, if you don't consider any of these. Psychosomatic. There's no doubt in my mind that the mind has tremendous powers over the body. I've seen it in my own life uh, where, you know, I had terrible allergy. I've told a story before, terrible allergy, and I sneezed at flowers and found out they were plastic flowers, you know. and. I mean, I've seen how my mind tricks me, and uh, I've seen people healed, psychosomatic. Dr. Paul Meyer healed a girl just a year or so ago who was blind by just telling her to go home and sleep in another room. She was psychosomatically blind. He found out by examining her there was nothing wrong. She should be able to see, but she had been blind for some time. So he told her to go home and sleep in another room. When you wake up, you'll be able to see, and she's been able to see ever since. So the mind has a tremendous power. Now, if Satan is the super mind, and he knows how those mind-body things work, let's just take the the one theory of how Satan works in a body or through a mind. Let's take the uh, John Eccles, one of the great uh, scientists in the world on the brain. He wrote the book, The Body and uh, the Brain and Its Mind and who did work to show that there's a difference between the mind and the brain. He believes that the mind ticks off the neurons in the brain, and that the neurons in the brain are kind of like the computer keyboard, and that the mind, by intending things, can, can set off these little neurons and then and create the whole thing. Now, let us suppose, on our theory of demon possession, that when someone yields his mind to the devil, the devil can actually come in and somehow get the control panel, get access to the control panel of the brain, and can tick off those neurons. He can create any sort of illusion in that person. It's possible, because once you get at the, the control panel there, you can mess up everything that comes from it. 
So I believe that Satan being a super mind, as, as bodies and minds yield to him, works in a paranormal, supernormal way through them. If you want to make that a third category, I think those three together explains everything Satan can do, and none of them are supernatural. None of them are suspending natural laws any more than when I cured myself, which I did, of a terrible allergy by saying, hey, you're sneezing at plastic flowers. Something's wrong. It's got to be up here, largely, any more than that was a supernatural event in my life. That wasn't supernatural. It was uh, psychosomatic. So I would list all of those in those three categories. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So would you say that the Satan doesn't have power or ability to do supernatural things? That's right. He does, he's not a supernatural being. He's a finite, limited creature. So what is the saying in the Revelation and well, that's simply saying that although he has power, he has the powers right now to overwhelm you. If God weren't protecting you and you didn't have the Holy Spirit in you and you didn't have a guardian angel, and he can't, he can't touch you. There's a fence built around you, and he can't go any farther than God will let him in using the powers he now has. He's limited in his pow the powers he now has on you and me as believers. But in Job's case, that was a special case uh, where God was being put to the test. Really, God was being put to the test, not uh, Job. It was really a fight between Satan and God. And Satan was saying, yeah, he's just serving you because you look at all the good stuff you did for him. And then God gave him permission to use the powers he had, but he didn't give him supernatural powers. Okay, I didn't make myself clear before. What I was saying is that when the scripture uses the word signs, wonder, and power, the same three words of Satan, it either one explicitly puts a, an adjective there, lying signs and wonders, or two, implies it by the context. And the fact that it explicitly says it once, we know the other ones are lying signs too, because Satan is doing them, and God said what he does is lying signs and wonders. So by no means are we challenging the inerrancy of Scripture. We're trying to interpret it in the context in which it is written. And secondly, take all the other Scriptures which say Satan is defeated, he's limited, he's just a creature, only God can is infinite and create life and resurrect the dead, and put those in balance and put the whole thing together and come up with a systematic uh, view of it. By their magical powers. But at the end of it, God overruled. I think when we talk about Satan teaching everything in life, we're not talking about the context of what he's doing. We're talking about the goal of what he's doing. The goal of what he's doing is to get us to live for God. Okay. Let, for the sake of argument here, the easiest way when you have a semantical problem, uh, to avoid the semantical problem, is just grant the other side the terminology. So for the sake of the argument, I'll just say Satan can perform miracles. And I'll, and I'll uh, uh, make the same point that I'm trying to make without doing that. Let us, let us agree that both God uh, and Satan, that they can both perform miracles. Okay, we have both of them can do miracles. Now, everyone, once you agree to the use of the term of say, both of them are performing supernatural, we must also agree that there's a difference. 
that we'll call that miracle A and miracle B, because the kind of miracles God can do, as you just said, is that they can over, he can overpower. So there's one thing, that whenever there's a contest between God and Satan, God always wins up. Two, that God is infinite and Satan is finite, right? Three, that only God can create life. Four, that only God can recreate life, resurrect the dead. Would you go with me that far? See, if you don't go at least that far, then I, I don't see one the scriptural grounds and two, it loses all the miracles in the Bible, the explicit purpose of which is to confirm a message from God, lose their apologetic value. Because Satan can do the same thing and epistemologically, we're in an absolute no man's land, an absolute quagmire, because we don't know which ones God is confirming and which ones Satan is confirming because Satan can do exactly the same type of things that God. So call it miracle, call it supernatural, call it whatever you want, but make sure that you make a very important distinction between the kinds of, quote, miracles Satan can do and the kinds of miracles God can do because they aren't in the same ballpark at all. And since the, and now, I'm leaving that argument and going back to my first one. Since they aren't in the same ballpark at all, and since they are so different, and since the Bible calls Satan's lying ones, why do we use the same term? We're just asking for confusion. We're just asking for trouble by using the same term. The Bible doesn't use it in unqualified sense. Always qualifies it by the context or by an adjective. And I think we're giving too much PR, too much credit, too much power to Satan, way beyond what the Bible does or way beyond what our systematic theology should permit. So I'm just saying, as for me and my house, we're not going to use the word miracle or supernatural anymore of Satan because I don't think he deserves to be called that in the same breath with what the Bible calls a divine miracle. Oh, sure. Okay, uh, and how would you spell that out? Okay, uh, let's 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 take a few. Uh, you're saying that we cannot do miracles at all as such as human beings, so that would be one difference. Okay, we're going to call. All right, uh, l let's uh, let's follow that through. Let's suppose that we we make a third category. We say that there's a qualitative difference here, and we won't debate about the word. I would like to say that there's only a quantitative difference. He has different powers, but we got to at least distinguish them. What are the types of things that we can do? What are the types of things that Satan can do that we can't do? Now, name name one. No, no, I don't mean with God's power. What are types of things that with human powers we can't do, but Satan with whatever you call his powers can do? Give me some example. We can do that. Our scientists can do that. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just, we're dialoguing here. I, you give me the examples, and I'll show you how every one of them is simply a matter of degree. None of them are a matter of kind. So that's my whole argument, that what we've got here is simply Satan has greater intelligence and he's more evil, so he's able to, he's got more power for sure because intelligence is power, uh, and therefore he can deceive better than uh, you and I can. We cannot be invisible? Our minds aren't. Our minds aren't limited. The, our spirits are not limited by time and space in any sense that his uh, yeah, I don't, is. I don't think by the negative process of not. Just an example here, and that's literally different from what you're going to do, is we're going to post things and say, no, that's not a different thing. I'm just.
could show you that it differs only in kind and degree. Sure it does, unless you can make some some something distinctive about Satan's powers that human beings don't have. And you can show me how this is qualitatively different. We don't have any right to say his powers are qualitatively different. I'm saying they're only quantitatively different. He's a better deceiver. He's got more psychosomatic powers, but it's still psychosomatic uh, power. And, and he's got a lot more troops uh, helping him out. He's not ubiquitous. He's not omnipresent and all of that. But if I had all those troops, and if I had all that smarts uh, that he has, and if I was, uh, you know, between death and resurrection, just a spirit uh, floating around, I could do the same type of things he could. Nothing wrong with verifying your view. <laughs> no, I'm saying that you can't argue from ignorance. You have to make some difference to make a difference. The argument, the argument from ignorance is no argument at all. What, what, is the, what are these powers that Satan has? What are they? So can our spirits. So, the us, our spirit isn't us. I mean, granted, while we're in the body, you can see our body. But you can't see my spirit. And I have a spirit, and my spirit will survive. When my body goes to the grave, my spirit will survive, and you won't be able to see it if you're in the body either. So, that, I mean, that's no difference. Well, you can't see my spirit, you can't see his spirit. Granted, we, 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 uh, but, but that's just saying that we're in the body and Satan's not in a body. But when our spirits aren't in a body, they're not limited to a body any more than your spirit uh, between death and resurrection is limited to a body. We, I, I'll grant you that right now in a body, I can't do what you can't do when you're in a body. So what does that prove? Nothing. argument is that it, whether you call it miracle B or supernormal that Satan can't do any of these things here that we just uh, put therefore all the things he does are really just simulating faking uh, etc by his super scientific or his uh, super deceptive powers I don't see any problem there. If you're if you're a spirit, why you can't do uh, why you can't do that? Why can't a super spirit do that? Uh, what? Yeah, you know, if you're not limited to a body and you're a super spirit, why can't you do that? Our spirit are the same as angels except the body yes. so spirit, as spirits if we weren't limited to a body and it, indeed that's what Matthew 22 30 says in the resurrection where neither uh, will be as angels sure 
answer. I think he can, but I don't think, I think he does it only be, when invited. I think you have to yield to it. I don't think you can just float around and get in there. That's why if you don't yield it up to someone else, but so can a hypnotist get in your mind. If you yield to a hypnotist, he can control you, make you do all sorts of dumb uh, things. Why? Because you've yielded under the power of suggestion to his mind and he's giving you commands and you're doing all these things that you wouldn't normally have done uh, otherwise by yielding to his mind. Now think of Satan as the super hypnotist who takes people who uh, yield to him and gets them to do all sorts of interesting things. Which doctors would fall in that category? Possession under this definition being that he controls the mind to the extent that it controls the body too. Yeah. Right. Possession is he's giving on the inside. It's not simply an external influence. You've actually and somehow invited him to the inside. He's taken over control there by your yielding to him, and then he's doing things that uh, from the inside out. He has more power. He's a spirit, so he's not limited to a body. He has super intelligence. Uh, he has super finite power, super finite intelligence, and he's not limited to a body. And he is totally, perversely, and irrevocably evil. We are not totally, perversely, and irrevocably evil, even though we're totally depraved, because we're still redeemable. He's not. They're the main differences. And with those, you can expect explain all of the so-called supernatural things that he does. topic uh, up until a few years ago I'd have been arguing exactly the same way you're arguing I've come a long uh, route through this whole thing and I argued uh, vociferously up until a few years ago that Satan had the uh, supernormal so when I taught angelology here when I first came to Dallas ten years ago I was teaching exactly the same thing that you're saying now it's only my research in the last five years uh, and seeing what's going on, the more deeply I look into it, the more I'm convinced uh, that we're way overselling uh, Satan's powers. Whatever you want to call them, uh, be sure and preserve this unique, infinite, overpowering, special creation, resurrection powers for God. Otherwise, we destroy the whole value of miracles in the Bible and exalt Satan on a level that the Bible never exalts him to. If a miracle is an act of God, it does, and that's how we're defining it. Specifically with those elements in terms of, of uh, calling into existence that all over that line. What what is really unique about a miracle? I mean, it's one thing to define it as an act of God. The next question is, give me some empirically, historically identifiable earmarks that I can tell which one is an act of God and which one isn't. And and I think there are some, and I think there are really four of those, and I don't want to go into them in detail now, but they're all clearly spelled out in the New Testament. You do an exegetical study of miracles in the Bible, especially in the Gospels, you'll find that miracles have four characteristics uh, in distinction, and that no satanic sign nor human magic comes up with all these uh, characteristics. They emulate some. One or two of them they can emulate well, but they cannot uh, emulate all of them, and that is the miracle is always immediate, never gradual. 
it's always successful, never fails, there's never a relapse, and it always is used to confirm a new revelation. Now, Satan can once in a while come up with things that are pretty immediate. Uh, he can get some healings, uh, and I'll explain that later, how he does it, but he can't heal all kinds of sicknesses 100% of the time, immediately, with no relapse. That's not, there is no one that can do that, no healers alive, and Satan doesn't do that either. Then, of course, the confirmation of the, the new revelation. So if there weren't these kind of earmarks for a miracle, then a miracle wouldn't be able to do exactly what the Bible says it can do. What does the Bible say a miracle can do? Hebrews 2, 4. Confirm the message. John 3. We know that you are a man come from God because no one can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Acts 2, 22. Jesus, a uh, man confirmed of God by signs and wonders. Now, miracles wouldn't have that confirmative power to point to Christ as the unique Son of God if they weren't unique. Because if Satan can do those same type of things, then, of course, the type of things that happen to Christ are not unique, and he might just be another occult leader, another New Ager, a guru from the first century. Now, where did you assume that we were saying Satan could be at several places at the same time? I'm not. No. He's not limited to a body, but that doesn't mean he's ubiquitous or omnipresent. I think he is not ubiquitous or omnipresent. And I don't think he, I don't think Satan as a person uh, can be simultaneously working in two people at the same time who are in different places. That's where he simulates ubiquity. He simulates ubiquity by the fact that he has so many troops. And they're all over, and he's in charge of them, and they have a central intelligence agency, uh, clearinghouse for it, and he, he simulates ubiquity and omnipresence, but it's really uh, just a super intelligence agency is all. And as we all know, KGB, CIA, they're all fallible, and uh, we don't know everything that's going on in the world, neither do the Russians, and neither does Satan. Okay, any other uh, thoughts as it relates to uh, this topic? Yeah, all I'm saying there is the miracle by definition in the Bible, the, the use of the word sign, wonder, and power, and especially these used in connection, which is the equivalent with the, of the uh, of miracle. What we mean by miracle is the biblical use of sign, wonder, and power. That though that kind of miracle always is a visible, external confirmation type of thing and that regeneration and other supernatural things are not visible external confirmation type things. Uh, here are a couple examples of things. So if you drew a circle this way, let's say that circle is a supernatural. Miracle is a circle inside the supernatural and outside of it are things like creation. The original creation was not a miracle, it was supernatural. And regeneration. And I haven't... Uh, I don't have an exhaustive list in my mind, but there would be a couple examples of supernatural events that aren't technically miracles in the sense that they are external signs. The, crea the original creation couldn't have been because there was nobody there for it to signify anything to. And it wasn't confirming any message that God had uh, given. No, I said not every supernatural thing is a miracle. All miracles are supernatural, but not all supernatural things are miracles. I don't think so. Well, 
let me give a yes or no answer to it to make a distinction. He can read your mind the way, only better, that your wife can read your mind. In other words, he knows he knows so much about you and the you know the the way you act and behave and the expressions on your face and all of that that he can pretty well do except he's better at it than your wife because he has super intelligence and he's smarter at reading those signs. And by the way, the uh, the magicians who do the ESP stuff, how do they do it? They do it by reading body language. I mean, there are many ways to do it, but one of the ways is reading body language. They're very good at reading body language. And certain people reveal their body language, and they look around an audience, and they can pretty well tell. If they came in this room and looked around, they could pretty well tell you which of you would make the best candidate for their experiments by, by your body language. Yeah. And so they do that. I think that's how Satan does. But in the sense of getting inside our mind and reading what's going on in our consciousness, no, unless demon possessed and he's already in there in fact then he's probably creating what's going on there by ticking off the neurons and so he he knows in the sense of what he's going to do and so he's reading your mind because it's his mind that has become your mind not satan personally satan personally can only operate on one person at a time uh, and I don't think any of us, I don't think any of us have been important enough to God's cause that Satan has ever bothered any of us. I mean, we would be flattering ourselves to think that Satan spent any time on us. In fact, he doesn't need to spend any time on us. Uh, someone said the world and the flesh, our own lust takes care of us. Uh, and Satan is working through that indirectly, but no, I don't think he's spent any time with us. Yeah, and he threw an inkwell at him. I mean, all this stuff. I don't know. Luther may have been important enough for Satan to tamper with. I mean, he, definitely Luther was upsetting Satan's apple cart. So I wouldn't deny Luther one appearance or two of Satan. <laughs> if you want to exalt Satan, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm not underestimating the opponent. I mean, he's got a lot of troops. And, and I think that Satan does that, and I was just about to diagram the answer uh, here. Here I am, however I live in the flesh. And the flesh is part of a whole world system. And the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. So here's how I diagram the New Testament truth about the world's flesh and the devil related to the believer. Satan works through the world system, through our flesh, to get to us. So every time I engage in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, which is all there is in the world, Satan's getting to me. The whole world lies in his lap. But I don't think you should diagram it this way. Here's Satan, here's the world, here's the flesh, and we've got three enemies out there, and they're all attacking the believer. I think that diagram misrepresents the New Testament, and it's very dangerous for the Christian life because a lot of people think, well, uh, the world can get to me, and the flesh can get to me, but Satan can't get to me. Satan, through his troops, through his whole plan, which is this world system, and this world system is opposed to God and is constantly appealing to the flesh. You turn on the TV, you walk, you drive by a billboard, and this whole world is reaching out. Lust, lust, pride, pride. It's all grabbing you all the time, saying, be proud, be lustful. So that's all Satan doing that. But it's not Satan personally, individually coming to me and saying, Geisler, look at that beautiful woman over there. You know, he, he doesn't have to do that to me. I got enough lust in me. I got enough lust in me that uh, he doesn't need to give any personal attention to that at all. All right, any 
further. It's not a course in demonology, but just suddenly, <laughs> suddenly turned into one here. In fact, just the, the whole UFO thing uh, is in that same category to me. The the fact that the fact that we cannot explain by our natural laws now how though that kind of phenomena could occur doesn't mean that Satan can't now do that by utilizing natural laws. We, the, here's, what, here's what we have said, we Christians, in that same vein down through the years. God must cause the bumblebee to fly because it's supernatural. they got too small a wings for the size of their body. Now we know how bumblebees fly. God must cause every earthquake. God must cause every tornado. God must cause uh, the eclipse of the moon. God causes meteors. All these that were, were, were said to be miracles, we will never make it to the moon. The world is square. Uh, you know, it's about time we learned from those lessons that uh, what we called supernatural wasn't supernatural at all, and we just set up the stage for the next deception. I sometimes think that, in fact, I have a little bit in our new book coming out on the New Age movement that Jeff and Amano and I are doing, we have a chapter on this very thing. I think this, the whole question of the seduction of Christianity that Dave Hunt is doing, I think in one sense that is all being used by Satan to seduce people. In other words, is it possible that the people who are warning most about Satan could both easily fall prey to satanic deception? And I'm answering that question affirmatively for several reasons. One, they're bringing all this attention to Satan. Two, they're giving all this press to Satan. He loves all of that. They're giving all this power to Satan. He loves that too. And they're saying these things are supernatural, and he loves that, being placed in the same category as God. And when we find out that they're only natural, we're already set up for the deception of the next stage. Satan comes along and does something. So I'm, I'm backing off all of that and uh, hanging in with uh, Danny Corm and Andre Cole, who are really with the original theologians. Almost all the classical theologians said the same thing. If you want to read a good section on it, there's a good section in, in Aquinas and the Summa Theologica, where he, he ra they raised these very same questions and answered them uh, hundreds of years ago.